The only thing they've ever been is connected to their military by it. As that privatization goes on, isn't it going to get harder and harder to enforce a sanction that right now is failing already? And if so, what do we need to do to create a regime in which individuals who can operate much more globally and without the cover of, of the government are in fact part of the shell game of buying assets, often nuclear related? I think you're right, and privatization is going to be a challenge in the future. Or crony privatization, yeah, if absolutely. you will. absolutely. But also, I think you, you made a very good point about having more of a, a collective approach to dealing with the UAE and this transshipment issue. I really think that's an important issue. The UAE is now the number one exporter of goods and services to Iran. The UAE remains the number one country that the Commerce Department is concerned about with these post-shipment verifications that fail. We sell our goods to the UAE. We go over and inspect them. They're either not there or they're not being used as intended. So there, there needs to be a concerted focus on the United Arab Emirates. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, in closing, uh, I went into Libya on the first trip into Libya after uh, we lifted all uh, visitation sanctions. It was in a U.S. military aircraft. And we had a several hours before we met with their, quote, leader. And what I discovered was that there was more American goods, more American brand names in Libya on that first trip than I would typically see at Walmart. Uh, so, you know, I have been somebody who is critical not of the laws we pass. I think the sanctions we're passing are right and they're attempting to give real power. But it's very clear that unless we get implementation from the administration, Someday, somewhere, we're going to have an event no different than October 23, 1983 at the Beirut uh, barracks where 241 Marines lost their life. The next one will be nuclear and, the, and it will be exponentially greater and it's likely to be here in the United States. I yield back. That's why we're having this hearing. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Congresswoman Maloney, five minutes. First of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for having the hearing and all of the panelists for your testimony and for your commitment of implementing the, the sanctions. Uh, I'd like to direct my question to, to Mr. Neuroder, since uh, this committee has direct uh, responsibility both legislatively and with oversight over procurement. Uh, Mr. Neuroder, under the new sanctions signed by the President, GSA is required to revise the Federal Acquisition Regulations to require a certification from each person that is a prospective contractor, that the person and any person owned or controlled by the person does not engage in any activity for which sanctions may be imposed under Section 5 of the Iran Sanctions Act. Specifically, can GSA commit to meeting the timetable, you have committed to meeting the timetable, uh, under the law to require this particular part to certify uh, that contractors are not uh, conducting uh, any prohibited business? Yes, we are definitely committed to doing that. We are definitely committed to having the interim rule in place. Uh, the uh, folks uh, in GSA are fully aware that this has started because the key is to implement the rule once it is in effect. And that's what we will well, do. Well, specifically, what steps has GSA taken uh, to ensure that companies that are making accurate and complete certifications, how do you know they're telling you the truth when they sign that box? Are you reviewing it or doing any research to make sure that they are accurate in what they're saying? Because obviously many companies have been conducting business e in the prior uh, sanctions that we had before our country, but before the world, actually. In the context of certifications and representations, that's a normal part of our business. And that's what companies do, and they certify as to many things. And but, we but what do you do to make sure that what they're certifying is accurate? Well, is the there any, what if a company knowingly makes a false certification and you find out, as we found out in Mr. Christoph's report, that many companies were doing uh, business with America and Iran in direct uh, con conflict with the prior Iran, uh, sanctions acts. Uh, what, what do we do if a company knowingly signs that box and, and uh, made a mistake or is just outright lying? Speaking from my view as the GSA suspension and debarment official, I am very concerned about contractor integrity and honesty. Uh, 
If that kind of situation comes to my attention, if need be, I'll ask the IG to investigate further to get me the facts. Otherwise, I have the ability to call in the company and ask them uh, whether the certification was accurate or not, and if not, to tell me what the facts are. And what if, the question is, what if you find out that they made a mistake or were outright lying? Is there a fine? Do you, do, you, do you debar them? Do you terminate the contract? What do you do if you find that situation? You know, there was this one article that was uh, 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 in the New York Times. I'd like permission to put it in the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, about U.S. enriches companies to find its policies on Iran. And this was in March of 20, March 6 of 2010. And it talks about companies that were defying our law, yet getting billions, literally, in, in American contracts. What happened? Did we terminate those contracts? Did we fine the people? If you find someone knowingly uh, really violates the law, uh, you said you'd do an IG investigation. And what if the IG investigation comes back, or the investigation by the New York Times comes back and says that they are defying our policies violating the law. Do we find them? Do we terminate our government contracts with them? What do we do? Specifically, I can speak to what I would do if I find that contractor non-responsible based upon an integrity issue, I would debar them. You would debar business. them? Yes. But there's no real requirement in law. What happened to these companies that are getting billions in American contracts and defying prior Iran Iranian sanctions? Did anything happen to these companies? I don't know, ma'am. Well, could you find out and get back to us and let us know? Yes. The, the new sanctions also prohibit the head of an executive agency from entering into or renewing a contract for the procurement of goods or services with a person that exports sensitive technology to Iran. And what role will GSA play in administering this portion of the law? That's a very sensitive area, sensitive technology. What role will GSA play in administering this section of the law? Of this, of this statute here? Yes. Uh -huh. the, as far as I know, that would be included in the FAR case. That will be included. My time has expired. Thank you very much. General Thank you for your time service. time has expired. Mm -hmm. I now yield to gentleman from Indiana, Congressman Burton. One of the uh, things that uh, has concerned me was, I guess, back in uh, 19, during the Clinton administration, Madeleine Albright uh, waived the uh, penalties on uh, a Russian company and I think a South American company because they uh, had uh, had done business with Iran in violation of the of the law. I think it was Gazprom, 1998, and Petronas oil companies. But uh, Madeleine Albright waived them at the direction of the president, and the president said that the United States would not impose sanctions on violators from the European Union, presumably with the hope that the EU would instead immediately take action on its own, but it didn't. And so these early uh, uh, sanctions made it clear to violators that they were not seriously threatened by the sanctions. One of the things that concerns me, as I said before, and I think Mr. Issa mentioned it as well, is that there's so much waiver authority by the president on almost every one of the uh, sanctions that are in the bill, which, which, which I opposed in the conference committee. But nevertheless, it's in there. and. Uh, uh, I just would like to once again express my concern about that because in the past no president going back to beyond Clinton has ever imposed any sanctions that, uh, that have uh, been carried through. The other thing I'd like to ask is I noticed in the, in the United Nations uh, uh, legislation it does provide a mechanism for civil penalties for uh, financial institutions that uh, uh, are involved in any kind of a bank transaction uh, of $250,000 penalty or an amount that's twice the amount of the transaction that is the basis of the violation. But one thing that I can't 
I can't really ascertain is whether or not the language in the bill that we passed provides a mechanism for freezing Iranian assets in the United States. I'm not sure that the UN bill uh, resolution does as well. Can you tell me, any of you, whether or not freezing assets in banks, their money in the United States, is, uh, is allowed in the United States, the bill that we passed and went through the conference committee, or in the UN or any of the other bills that passed, the EU or, or any of them? Freezing their assets, absolutely saying you cannot let them have their money. Um, yeah, most Iranian assets in the United States would already be frozen now under virtually un, under a whole wide variety of, of of Iran of Iran sanctions legislation. And the Treasury Department, over the past few years, has designated most Iranian banks under our under our counter counterterrorism or counterproliferation authority. That freezes their assets to the extent that there are assets in the United States. There would be, frankly, very few assets of any of those banks in the United States. So. Um, the, I think what the, the problem that the bill was trying to get at with respect to banks was not, was not freezing their assets that are under U.S. control because but there aren't assets. any assets under U.S. control, and we've, we've, already, we've already designated these banks and applied sanctions on them. Uh, what I think it was trying to get at was uh, third-party banks um, that, were providing, that were providing these designated Iranian banks indirect access into the U.S., and I, that's, what, that's what the bill uh, tries to get at, and I think it's very important I think it was a very important um, problem uh, that Congress identified, and it's something that we're going to try to use to, to solve. But the, 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 the assets of these banks, to the extent that they're in, in U.S. jurisdiction, are, are, are likely already frozen. Mr. Einhorn, uh, you're with the State Department. In the event that uh, General Electric, uh, which has been accused of doing business with subsidiaries through their subsidiaries to Iran, if they continue to do business in any way, uh, and uh, there are sanctions imposed upon them because of that business being conducted. Uh, would the State Department in any way recommend a waiver of that penalty? Because uh, that's been done, as I said before, by Madeleine Albright during the Clinton administration. Um, Congressman, um, without reference to any particular U.S. entity. Well, any company. I just any, used that any, as an example. Any company. Uh, when uh, we get information, credible information, that uh, a company is uh, involved in sanctionable activity under, law, under the law, uh, we, will, uh, we will examine this very closely. Uh, we'll go to the company itself, we'll go to U.S. Embassy, see what they can find out, we'll inquire of the intelligence community, we'll, we'll uh, accumulate well, Let me just say, w will the recommendation of the State Department be that they will not weigh the sanctions to the President? Oh, I, I can't predict what the recommendation of the State Department would be. It will depend on the situation. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Congressman Burton, you talked about waiver authority and so forth. Uh, so, sometimes it's very useful to have that authority in there, and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, it's, uh, sometimes you, you deal with a company that may have engaged in sanctionable activity. Uh, what you want them to do is to stop that activity and to pledge not to repeat it again. Uh, you need some flexibility in the law, essentially, to bargain with that company. Uh, and if there's a situation where a company has stopped all sanctionable activity and pledges not to resume it, uh, then perhaps uh, the waiver authority, the ability to waive sanctions, is a useful tool to stop that sanctionable activity. And that, uh, th that's worthwhile. The gentleman's time has expired. And I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Congressman Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Einhorn, I, I guess what you're getting from some of these questions is whether or not any administration has been strong enough uh, on any of these sanctions through time. Uh, while I have faith in this administration, uh, with all due respect, I'm not sure your, your testimony would evoke greater faith that we would move forward um, appropriately with the new sanctions. And from, from page four of your testimony, um, in this review, we identified a number of cases dating from before the Obama administration which uh, appeared problematic and warranted more thorough in consideration. Um, given the extraordinary circumstances here and the fact that the, the time frame for a viable deliverable weapon seems to be collapsing upon itself, 
what does problematic mean what's it just if you add that into the equation and the fact that we're reading articles every day about how spry other countries seem to be circumventing these these uh, actions you know are we spry enough are we forceful enough and can you be a little more forceful from that testimony? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, I, I can't speak for previous administrations. I certainly can't speak for the eight years of the George W. Bush administration where no determinations were made, no sanctions were, uh, were made, uh, no, de no determinations of even sanctionability. All I can speak for is the Obama administration. And Secretary Clinton early on uh, instructed us to act aggressively uh, to implement the law. Uh, we have carried out a thorough uh, review of a large number of cases. We winnowed those down uh, to less than 10. We're now in the process uh, of uh, uh, engaging other agencies. The Secretary of State has been delegated authority to take decisions. Uh, we have to get the input from other agencies. We'll provide that input to Secretary Clinton, and she will make uh, decisions. Uh, I, would, uh, I, would, I would say that she, uh, before very long, will have to make determinations under the law as to the uh, sanctionability uh, of uh, this uh, relatively small number of cases, fewer than 10. And can you ballpark your time frame here? Uh, uh, she wants us to move expeditiously. As I say, uh, this, the, the dossiers um, are out to other uh, agencies. Uh, we need to hear back from them, get the recommendations, and feed those to the secretary, and she can make decisions. Uh, and I appreciate that. And for the panel, switching directions, uh, given the short time frame we have with you, I, I just, to the extent you can, tell us a little more your thoughts about how China plays into this equation, filling the gap, perhaps flooding everything else that we're trying to, overwhelming everything else we're trying to do here? Yeah, I think China is one of the countries in which the U.S. attention has, has to turn to. Uh, the EU sanctions were passed, but China has gone over the past 15 years from having minimal trade with Iran to being uh, at the, either the first or the second biggest importer and exporters of goods and services to Iran. They are aggressive in investing in Iran's energy sector. They, their companies have been sanctioned under the nonproliferation provisions multiple times to no effect. So that's the next country that I think we need to turn our attention to. And, and by attention, your suggestions? Um, Mr. Einhardt certainly has some suggestions, but I think there has to be a, a recognition that, at least with some of the nonproliferation sanctions, when you have Chinese companies that have been sanctioned three or more times, there has to be a reevaluation of the effectiveness of those particular sanctions because it's not changing their behavior. If I can just follow up, uh, Congressman, uh, you're right to identify China. China is of concern to us in this regard. I I uh, China I'm has backfilled uh, when a number of responsible oh, countries have uh, st uh, distanced themselves uh, from Iran. Uh, we uh, need to speak with the Chinese. We've begun to raise this at the highest levels with Chinese leaders. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Glazer and I will be going to China uh, in August uh, to begin a dialogue, and this dialogue will be pursued at all levels. Uh, we need for them to enforce the, l the Security Council resolutions conscientiously, uh, and we also need for them not to backfill uh, f uh, when responsible countries have uh, distanced themselves from Iran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Well, Duncan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to read some quotes uh, from when this issue a couple of times that it came up before. And if I have any time, if there's any time left, then I'd be happy for you to respond. But a little over three months ago, the Congressional Quarterly on April 22nd had an article which said, quote, Business groups say the House and Senate bills could effectively prohibit, the U prohibit U.S. businesses from partnering with certain foreign companies, even if the relationships have nothing to do with Iran. And then they added the National Association of Manufacturers released a study arguing that at least $25 billion in exports and 210,000 jobs could be lost if sanctions legislation is enacted. 
The next day in the Hill newspaper, Patrick Disney and Laura Friedman, and I'm not familiar with who they are, wrote this in an article. They said, the U.S. has sanctioned Iran for decades with little to show for it, and added that, cert quote, certain sanctions have unambiguously failed to achieve their objective, contributing instead to the suffering of ordinary Iranians. And last December 15th, the National Security Subcommittee had a hearing in this very room in which I participated, and four witnesses testified, and I will tell you that all four of them were against sanctions. And Dr. George Lopez, uh, chair of the uh, Kroc Institute at Notre Dame, said that sanctions, quote, will inflict economic pain in Iran but produce no political gain on issues important to the United States. In fact, research in the history of sanctions cases predicts that these sanctions imposed on this Iranian government in the manner imposed in H.R. 2194 will do more harm than doing nothing. James F. Dobbins, director of the International Security and Defense Policy Center, said that while sanctions are sometimes appealing, they are not without cost to the imposing states, and, quote, some of that cost is eventually transferred <coughs> to the American taxpayer. Further sanctions against Iran are not likely to alter Tehran's nuclear policies. Sanctions will weaken the state economically and even militarily and also strengthen uh, that imposes it and strengthen the regime's domestic support and hold on power. In other words, strengthen Iran's uh, hold on power. Journalist Robin Wright said, quote, the regime could exploit new sanctions as an excuse to clamp down further on the opposition and said, quote, sanctions also hold the potential to hurt the public more than the regime. And finally, Suzanne Maloney, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, said, quote, sanctions do not offer a cure-all or a silver bullet for resolving our longstanding concerns about Iranian policy. There should be no illusions about the likelihood that even more rigorous and more broadly implemented sanctions can produce a reversal uh, of Iran's nuclear calculus. And what I'm concerned about is, is that sanctions will end up hurting the poor and lower income people of Iran more than anybody while doing very little good for us. And I noticed that Mr. Kristof said in his testimony a while ago that because these sanctions we have imposed now are the toughest ever, that we need to very soon have a, 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 a very good analysis of the effectiveness of these sanctions. Now, if anyone wishes to respond, yes, sir, Mr. Einhorn. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. Uh, there is a long debate uh, on the utility of sanctions. Do they work? Uh, what is their impact? And so forth. Um, our view uh, is that uh, sanctions are not an end in themselves. Uh, they are a vehicle for, uh, for uh, changing Iran's behavior. We want them to recalculate costs and benefits and come up to the, with the conclusion uh, that they are better off uh, uh, ending their defiance of the international community and, uh, and meeting their international uh, obligations. I think until recently, uh, Iranians have been very self-confident that they could have their cake and eat it too. They could have their nuclear ambitions, but they could uh, also have good commercial, financial uh, relationships with the international community. What we have been trying to do is turn up the pressure on Iran so that it has to make a choice between one or the other. And there is pretty good evidence uh, coming in every day uh, that uh, Iranians are feeling the pressure. Uh, uh, every day another major company decides to distance itself from Iran. And we think Iran is beginning to feel the heat. Uh, we read uh, in the papers by Iranian economists uh, that uh, their economic situation is worsening, uh, that oil production is declining, that the cost of exports, uh, uh, the cost of imports uh, is increasing because of the difficulty of getting financing. Uh, so we believe uh, we have uh, begun to turn the corner uh, on, on this, and that Iran is feeling the pressure, uh, but we have to continue okay. stepping that up. Well, let me, let me just say, because my time is up, uh, uh, we have given people in our government great power through this sanctions legislation, but I hope that it's, that power is exercised in a humane and judicious manner so that we don't end up hurting an awful lot of uh, people in the process. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now recognize
Mr. Foster from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, D Director Kristoff, um, were the Chinese sanctioned, um, the Chinese companies that were sanctioned state-owned or private, privately owned companies? You know, I don't know that, Mr. Foster, but I can try to get that information for you for the record. Okay. Uh, uh, well, what I'm getting at is whether it's reasonable to view the Chinese government as basically a holding company. And mm -hmm. so that the sanctions, um, you know, presumably if there's a subsidiary that violates the sanctions that reflects onto the holding company as a general principle, is that how it, it yes. must work? Yes. Right. And so that, you know, in the case which I think is likely that at least some of these sanctioned companies there, you could make a, a reasonable logical argument that in fact, you know, the holding company, namely the Chinese government, uh, might be sanctioned as a whole. Mm -hmm. And it's a, I was just wondering if you could explore that. In, yeah, I'll look in into a, that. For the record. Um, Deputy Secretary Glazer, um, what do you view the biggest holes are in the financial net that we're trying to cast around the IRGC? You know, wh what are, you know, for example, how are illicit um, arms or technology um, uh, um, shipments typically paid for? Um, you know, are there enhancements to the international reporting that would really do you a lot of good that we could encourage at the congressional level? Thank you uh, for, the, for the question. I mean, I'm glad you focused on the IRGC because I think that that's really one of the key entities we should be looking at. The IRGC is engaged in, you know, the, the, the whole range of, of, of bad conduct uh, that we associate with Iran from proliferation activities, terrorist activities, uh, suppression of suppression of democracy within Iran. The IRGC is engaged across the board. Um, it is also a very attractive target because they have such extensive economic and financial networks both within Iran and and throughout the world. Uh, so that's their strength, but it's also you know it's also their weakness. It also uh, creates a target-rich environment. Uh, the the challenge the challenge that we've had up until really the last the last month. Um, is uh, is is getting universal universal action with respect to the IRGC. We've had we've had tremendous success with that recently with 1929 and, and really most especially with the European Union's common position this week, which which applies sanctions to the IRGC in Europe across the board. Uh, the IRGC as an entity plus numerous subsidiaries. Uh, again. The challenge now, I mean, the, the challenge I don't think is a legislative one. I don't think it's an authority challenge. The challenge is to make this as broad as, and deep as possible, uh, to uh, get out on the road, to present information uh, to the private sector, to present information to foreign governments, to let them know what kind of activity the IRGC is engaged in in their countries, um, and then uh, expect them to live up to their obligations under, under international law and under their domestic law. And that's what, I mean, that's, that's what we have been doing, and that's, that's what we are doing. And I, and as uh, Mr. Einhorn said, I, I, think, I think we're starting to see that that's working. Um, I and mean, we both mentioned it, but I, I, I think it's, it's, it's worth underscoring. Catalambia is one of the primary companies owned by the IRGC, and they just had to pull out of South Pars, and they had to pull out uh, because, as they themselves admitted, it was against Iran's national interest for them to be involved because they, they, couldn't, get, they couldn't get the international well, Are you in. seeing evidence that individuals are transferring money to a, you know, private accounts offshore that you can't identify in havens, or, or is that something you're dealing with acceptably? Well, I, the, I mean, the issue of uh, bank, bank secrecy havens is a, is, is a broader issue than, than it applies to, to, uh, yeah, to Iran. Um, look, you know, the, the Iranians are you know, very sophisticated and they're very smart um, and they have complex financial systems and uh, they know how to engage in deceptive financial practices and they do and we, we, try to, we try to prevent that from happening but the fact of the matter is is that on a case-by-case on -case basis, on a transaction-by-transaction -transaction basis, they're going to be able to do transactions that they want to do. The, 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 the challenge is on the systemic level uh, because you can't run an economy on deceptive financial practices and so the, the, the challenge is to make it costly or risky or less effective for them to do that. Um, and I, I do think we're succeeding in that. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, let, uh, Mr. Einhorn, um, the, the Iran Sanction Act has, re has recently amended, um, states that the president shall initiate an investigation when a credible evidence uh, is presented, and I think a report within 180 days. If, and um, are, are, how, is, how is that going? And well, Congressman, uh, this, this law was only enacted less than a month ago, and we're now in the process of figuring out how to uh, implement it effectively and how to deal with the 180-day period. 
um, you know, often uh, thorough investigations of these activities uh, take longer than 180 days because uh, often you get some initial public indication that a, a deal is in the works, but it may not be consummated for, you know, three, five, ten years. Uh, so it's, it's a challenge to wrap everything up in 180 days. We're trying to figure out how to, how to do that. And but you are committed to, to the 180 absolutely. day, at least some kind of finding in 180 days. A absolutely. We're, con we're committed to implementing that aspect of the law, all right. aspects of the law. Right. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield to the gentleman from Arizona, Congressman Flake. I, th I thank the chair and thank those who have testified. I'm sorry I missed part of it, uh, uh, the obligations, but so I hope you're, I'm not plowing the same ground here. But Mr. Einhorn, in your view, let me just step back a bit. Is it possible to have an effective sanctions regime without the active participation um, of Russia and China? Uh, I, I think it, it's important. I mean, as you, your, your question implies, it is uh, very important for Russia and China to be involved. Uh, they were involved to some extent already in the sense that they um, uh, voted for Security Council Resolution 1929, which is the base for many of the national measures that have subsequently been taken. So that's positive. But we also need their effective uh, enforcement of nine, 1929, and we also ask them to recognize their responsibility as permanent members of the Security Council to go beyond 1929 uh, and to join with the European Union and us and the Australians and Canadians and have a strong regime of pressure uh, that can move Iran uh, to, to meet its international obligations. But Russia and China are very important. Uh, very important, but not really helping, is what you're saying. Well, uh, you, um, you, you you know, recently t Russia took an important decision. Uh, it decided that in accordance with the Security Council resolution, it would not deliver uh, an advanced air defense system, the S-300, to Iran. We've been pressing Russia very hard for a number of years not to make that delivery, and they've agreed not to make it, and that's positive. Um, should we worry about getting f too far ahead of our allies, both our European allies and, and uh, ahead of Russia and China as well? Uh, I mean, there are two schools of thought here. You, if we lead, that they'll follow. Uh, but there's also the, the notion that if we get too far out ahead, uh, out ahead, they won't. Where do you think we are now? Uh, do we risk uh, getting too far ahead so we don't have active or enthusiastic ongoing cooperation, not just public, but, uh, but privately enforcing these resolutions as well with Russia and China? We, we are very grateful that the European Union took the decision it took this week. Uh, it set uh, some very high standards for sanctions. Uh, we will use that high standard in our discussions. Uh, uh, Danny Glazer and I will be in, in Seoul and in Tokyo next week. Uh, to see if Japan and South Korea could come up to that mark. Uh, we'll also go to China later uh, in the month. Uh, it's important uh, that China uh, uh, step up and, and, uh, and recognize its international responsibilities here. With uh, gasoline, uh, we, we keep saying that we're targeting the regime and not the people of Iran. We're, we're just looking at, at uh, items that would help them build nuclear capacity. Uh, how is gasoline used to build nuclear capacity? Uh, well, gasoline is not directly used, obviously, to build nuclear uh, capacity. Uh, but uh, I think uh, by putting some pressure on their access to refined petroleum products, uh, you, uh, you encourage them to, to recompute what's in their best interest and to recognize that unless they stop their defiance of the international community, uh, the uh, future for Iran will look a lot uh, dimmer, and hopefully they're coming to that conclusion. That, that's my point. I mean, it, it's, it's not directly, uh, but we all know how, how uh, these sanctions regimes usually work. They only work if you have leaders that care a little more about the plight of the people. Uh, I mean, if, if we... Uh, 
thought rationally, we certainly wouldn't have had the same embargo we've had in Cuba for 50 years, for example. Um, so I, I, I worry that uh, we, we say publicly, hey, we don't want to hurt the Iranian people, we don't want to drive them into the arms of the regime, um, but uh, then we target uh, items that have nothing to do with building nuclear capacity, but, uh, but would provide a pinch on, on the people without hurting the regime. We all know the regime finds ways, certainly, uh, when we see just example after example after example of uh, the ways that the, the black market works here. And uh, our, our own Secretary of State has said, use the term leaky. These sanctions are, are leaky, and that's, that's quite an understatement. So anyway, uh, thank you for your testimony. If I could just respond to that, it, uh, all sanctions regimes are leaky to some extent. Uh, but what we're seeing here is that um, the sanctions are becoming more and more comprehensive, and that's good. As far as the uh, dealing with the people of Iran is, con you know, is concerned, our intention is not to harm the people of Iran. Our intention is to get the leadership of Iran to reconsider. And that's why we've done things like uh, ensure uh, that organizations like the IRGC uh, and ERISL, the Iran Shipping Line, uh, is, uh, is specifically targeted. Uh, that will be an important signal uh, to the elites of Iran. The right, gentleman's time has expired. And I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, uh, Congressman Van Hollen, for five minutes. Chairman, thank all of you for your uh, testimony today. I just want to follow up on some of the conversations that have uh, questions that have already been asked. And I think, obviously, there's consensus to the extent we can broaden uh, those countries that are participating in the sanctions. Obviously, they're more, much more effective. And the step the EU took uh, recently was another positive uh, measure. To what extent does the sanctions regime that we have here um, overlap with what the EU has done? And what specific steps are we taking now with the EU to make sure that we uh, have uniform enforcement as much as much as possible. Well, I, Mr. Glazer may want to uh, add, add to this. Um, uh, we uh, have the most comprehensive sanctions regime against Iran than any other country in the world. You, you realize that. Yes. Uh, I think what the Europeans did this week really uh, closed that gap quite significantly. There are still differences. Uh, but the gap was co closed very significantly, and I think it was probably a very rude shock uh, to the leaders of, uh, of Iran to, uh, to see the, the strength of the steps they took. Let me, just to follow up, uh, there's been some concern expressed about uh, the relationship with some of the banks in Germany, specifically, uh, with respect to Iran. Could you, could you comment on that, especially in light of the decision taken by the EU? Uh, how the EU decision will impact especially the question of German banks doing business with Iran? Um, well, I, I think the EU decision, the EU common position is going to significantly impact any German banks or any European banks um, that are doing business uh, with Iran. So any German banks um, that are doing business with any of the seven banks uh, designated by the EU will have to stop. Um, any German or other European banks uh, that do uh, any uh, sizable transaction uh, with, uh, with, with Iran will have to get pre-approval for that transaction, and they have to wait four weeks uh, for that pre-approval. Uh, um, so uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really it's a, it's, a, it's, a huge, it's a huge step forward. You know, that said, there, there, there are some German banks. There's one German bank that was discussed in the press, EIH, uh, that does remain a concern for us, and that's something that we continue to discuss with the Europeans and with Germany in particular. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, I, I think their business will inevitably decline based on the, um, based on the new EU measures, um, but it is something that's going to remain a, a subject of conversation with, between us and our allies in Germany. All right. Uh, Mr. Einhorn, you mentioned uh, the fact that uh, China had voted for the, the resolution of the United Nations. Obviously, they, they also worked very hard to weaken uh, some aspects of the proposal uh, we, we put forward. So. I, I'm pleased to hear you're going to be traveling uh, there in the near future. Uh, how do you uh, grade the prospects for getting the, the Chinese to really be serious uh, about, about this effort in Iran? I mean, I think it's clear based on their actions to try and dilute 
sanctions at the, at the, at the UN that uh, they're, they're obviously not on board. Uh, what, what goals do you have specifically for that trip? Uh, yeah. How would you measure success uh, in, your, in your discussions with the Chinese? Well, um, uh, two important criteria. One is that they enforce uh, the uh, letter of Resolution 1929 conscientiously uh, and that if there are Chinese entities that are in any way assisting, for example, the missile programs uh, in Iran, that China takes strong steps against those entities. That's one. Second, uh, we want China uh, to recognize its responsibility not to backfill uh, when uh, responsible governments uh, show restraint and distance themselves from Iran. That will be very important. The, the Chinese will argue that they have important energy security needs, tremendous demands for energy. They need to do what's necessary to ensure energy security. Uh, in, in our view, um, they are overachieving uh, in terms of their energy security needs. Uh, we think they have to kind of rebalance their priorities and recognize a, a, that as a permanent member of the Security Council, uh, it's their responsibility uh, to prevent proliferation and to put pressure on Iran and persuade Iran not to pursue nuclear weapons. Thank you. Uh, the, my last question relates to the um, standard uh, that uh, applies to granting a waiver uh, of the sanctions. And uh, as I understand the legislation, the standard is it, that it be vital to the national security interests of the United States and that the government with primary jurisdiction uh, over the sanctions violator is closely cooperating with the United States in this effort. Um, this is probably by way of a comment more than a question, but I, I think it's absolutely essential that we um, keep that standard as, as, as tight as possible. Uh, and, you know, for example, I think it would be very difficult to argue uh, today uh, the Chinese or the, the Russians were meeting uh, the intent of that language with respect to, to cooperation given their conduct. And so I would, I would hope uh, that you send the right signal uh, to others as how you interpret that because uh, you don't want it to, you don't want your decisions, a flexible interpretation of the rule to send a green light uh, to others that they're going to be able to get away. Uh, with this, so I, I, I hope uh, that will be that, that that discretion will be pursued in a way that maximizes um, a, a tight, uniform sanctions regime. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentleman from uh, Maryland. Uh, now I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Utah, Congressman Chafee. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm in, for the sake of clarity. In, in rapid fashion, I'm looking for like a yes or no here. I just want to make sure that each of your organizations is committed to the timetables laid out in the legislation. You have the infrastructure, you have the resources, and that you're going to be able to make the time timetables that are implemented in the legislation. Perhaps we can start with Mr. Einhorn. All right. If you want yes or no, yes. Is there anything in your way to making sure that you get these done? Please continue down the line. Yes. Okay. Yes. We don't have anything to implement, but we assure continued oversight on the part of GAO to make sure they are implementing it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Einhorn. Um, so that's a yes, right? That's a yes. <laughs> that's an absolutely. That's, that's good to hear. Um, uh, Mr. Einhorn, let's talk for a moment, if we could, about Turkey, given the recent situation. What, can you assess the level of commitment that they have to helping and assisting in these efforts? Uh, we believe the government of Turkey shares our objective uh, of preventing Iran from getting nuclear weapons. Um, uh, we uh, appreciate the hard work that Turkey has put in in trying to persuade uh, Iran to adopt a more reasonable position. Uh, sometimes uh, we differ on, with Turkey on uh, tactics. Uh, for example, um, uh, Turkey joined with Brazil and Iran uh, in a what was called the Tehran Declaration in May, um, and they supported a what we considered to be an unacceptable version of a proposal we supported back in October on refueling the Tehran research reactor. Um, we 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 didn't appreciate the timing of that because it was on the eve 
of voting on the UN Security Council resolution, and perhaps some of the participants had in mind derailing that vote on a Security Council resolution. So sometimes we disagree uh, with Turkey on tactics, uh, but uh, uh, we believe their motivation is good. They want to solve this Iran nuclear issue just as we do. Uh, Mr. Glazer, um, any sense or any uh, assessment of using the Patriot, Patriot Act along the way uh, if we need to use that authority? Yeah, I, we have we we have a wide variety of, of authorities um, under under the Patriot Act under IEPA, and uh, we we consider all of those all of those authorities. Uh, any authority that we have that we think we could put to good use would be considered. As the Treasury, and then I'd like to go to State if I could. I, my time will run short here. What are your top just very rapidly because the time's so short? What are your top three concerns about Billy? fully implementing all these sanctions? Like, what are the three things that you're worried about that are obstacles we need to overcome to actually fully implement? Yes, please. Uh, to, full, to fully implement, uh, you know, as, uh, you know I, I keep coming back. I, the, the, chal the, the challenge is to make these sanctions as broad as possible, and I, what I mean by that is global, vigorous global implementation. That's, that's the big challenge. We, we, ha we now have the tools, we have the authorities, really throughout the world. The, the challenge is global implementation. And when I say deep, I mean uh, countries going as appropriate and as necessary beyond the scope of what they're So which three, which three countries, then, would you be most worried about? Well, I, I'll tell you which three regions I think are, need to be focused on right now, and that's the Middle East, Asia, and South America. Uh, Europe has taken strong action. We've taken strong action in North America. Australia's taken strong action. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as Mr. Einhorn said, we're, uh, Bob and I are going to be traveling to uh, to uh, Japan and South Korea uh, uh, next week. We're going to be in China later in the month. Asia is important. Uh, my boss, as I said before, Stuart Levy is going to be in UAE uh, in the next couple of weeks. The Middle East is important. M South America is important too. Mr. Reinhardt? I, I would agree with, with, with Danny's characterization. I would just say it's very important to maintain the momentum. Uh, since, uh, the, in, since June, when uh, the Security Council resolution was uh, adopted, there have been a series of actions, uh, including uh, U.S. executive order designations. We talked about Australia, Canada, Europe, and so forth. We have to keep up the momentum. The Irani, you know, part of this is psychological. Part is, you know, practical on the ground, what's happening economically, but part of it is psychological. Uh, we have to demonstrate to Iran's leaders uh, that the situation is going to deteriorate. It's going to continue to deteriorate unless they change their behavior. So keeping the momentum up throughout this summer into the fall will be critical. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the UN uh, sanctions resolution 1929 was a positive step. However, the financial sanctions in the resolution left something to be desired. For example, only one new bank was added to the list of sanctioned entities. And even here in the U.S., the sanctions annou announced by the Treasury Department last month added only one bank to the list of those sanctioned. Um, is the Treasury Department aware of foreign financial institutions that continue to conduct business with sanctioned Iranian banks, and what steps is the Treasury Department taking to ensure corresponding relations between the U.S. and foreign banks are not